Hearts and welcome to tutorial exercise number six, the video that shows you what you need to do to get this all done. Uh, right here on your screen, you can see that I've got the uh, lesson plan assignment sheet already up and ready to go. And one of the things I want to highlight is that after this tutorial video, you'll have all of the information that you need uh, for the STATA side of things to be able to complete part two of your research report. Uh, for the grad students, you're going to want to pay attention to next week because that's when we do regression analysis and many of you are going to want to do that, graduate students only. For the undergraduate students, this is this is like the, the key tutorial where we put everything together uh, so you can see all the things that we expect you to do for your research report where you're testing the hypothesis with those three control variables. So as you'll note, we'll talk about how we're building cross tabs, interpreting statistical significance, uh, interpreting measures of associations, and testing for the effects of control variables. We're going to be interpreting cross tabs through all of this as well. Um, one thing I want to note is that you're going to want to watch all of the lecture videos, particularly videos the both at least part A or at least part B, like one of the videos for uh, 3.4, because that shows you how to test for control variables and I walk you through the correct ways to do interpretations of things. So those lecture videos are really important. Given that, um, I'm going to give you more days to get this tutorial exercise done just because I know you have to do more prep for it. Anyway, what I want to show you here is the uh, Stata side of things. So I'm just going to, my Stata is open. Here we are. Uh, because I am lazy, I'm going to go and open up my uh, lesson plan, but I'm going to walk you through all these other sorts of things. Okay. So, pardon me. Right. Okay. Remember how I talked about the general format for the cross tab last time was that you're going to do like tab is the state of command and then you've got your rows and your columns. Another way of looking at this in terms of your general format for your uh, cross tabs is that you have to do the tab command, you put your dependent variable and your independent variable, and then you've got your comma, your options. So where you want your percentages, the kind of inferential statistic you want, the measure of association that you want. So that's the general um, format just basically for a cross tab. What you need to do for uh, this particular tutorial is that you're going to use the 2015 election study. So the D2L quiz has been done on the understanding that you're using 2015 for your particular tutorial assignment. So you're going to want to follow along perhaps with this, but I'm using a different election study because I want you to go and just do it with 2015. So the reason why I'm not using 2019 here is because I don't want to replicate something that you might be doing for your papers, uh, and therefore it makes it feel like you're cheating because you're using a tutorial example. That's why I use these different, uh, different election studies for this. So for you, you will be using 2015 the 2015 CES for the tutorial election study. Uh, I've given you your two, uh, your three variables that you need. You need age, you need voter turnout, and you need seeing voting as a duty versus a choice. They're all there from 2015. Make sure you're using the 2015 election study when you do it. For my example, uh, I'm using 2011 because I want you to do this with, you know, uh, all of the great skills, we're practicing this. So this is just to show you what this looks like, but then you are going to go and do it on the different data set here. So I need age as a variable, I need turnout as a variable, and I need duty as a variable. So which ones are my variables here? What I have to do is I have to go and find them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my 2015 election, 2011, 2011, I'm doing 2011, right? So I'm looking at my 2011 election study. I'm going to look for age. And it doesn't seem to come up there. What I know I need to do is look for birth year. This is my year of birth. So CPS 1178, that is my age variable. Oopsies, let's get rid of that. Uh, let's, did you vote? Well, that didn't help. Uh, vote. What I need is the, did you vote in the election? PES 11-3. That is the variable I need as well for voter turnout. And then I'm just going to search here again for duty and look at that. CPS 11-62. Uh, 
Those are the three variables I'm going to be using. Remember, when you do this, you are going to be using the 2015 election study, and I've already pulled out those variables that you need there. Okay. So the hypothesis that I have is that the older someone is, the more likely they are to vote. One of the things that has concerned me looking at quiz two and a couple of the other assignments is that some of you are still struggling with making sure that you specify your hypotheses properly and completely. So I'm gonna show you a couple of ways you can do this. Um, the first one is I think probably the most elegant way. You could just say the older someone is, the more likely they are to vote. Uh, age is ordinal and this is one of these, the older, the more likely they are to do something. This is like voter turnout is nominal. So this is one of the ways you could do it where the older somebody is, the more likely they are to vote. That is a complete comparison. It's the older, it's a complete comparison, which is helpful. Uh, the other way I could do it is older people are more likely to vote, oopsies, to vote than younger people. This one is a little bit longer, it's a little bit clunkier, uh, but it also completes the comparison. So I don't have to ask, who am I comparing anybody here to? If I say the older someone is, the comparison is there, the older that they get, the more likely they are to do something. Uh, with the other version, you've got older people are more likely to vote than younger people, so I've got a complete comparison there as well. Uh, and it's completed in terms of the independent variable, in terms of the hypothesized cause, rather than the dependent variable. So a big mistake is if I did older people are more, more likely to vote than not vote, this would be a big mistake. Um, and the reason why is that I'm defining the hypothesis in terms of the dependent variable. So in terms of the effect rather than the cause, we don't want to do this. So we get rid of that. So we've got two versions of the hypothesis or two ways we could state basically the same hypothesis. The older someone is, the more likely they are to vote or older people are more likely to vote than younger people. So for you in the tutorial, you're just going to want to no note this, but uh, for your research reports, you're really going to want to make sure that you've got your hypothesis properly and completely specified. So proper specification is in terms of the independent variable. Complete specification is making sure that you actually have the comparison there. Um, looking In this case, it's looking at age. The older someone is, the more likely they are to vote. Okay. This means that I need to recode age. And so what I want to do is to see what this variable looks like. So I'm going to do set more off tab that particular variable. Okay. And so what I can see here is that I've got the year that everybody was born. Uh, and this is interesting, but it doesn't actually tell me how old they were in 2011. So what I have to do is generate age equals 2011 minus this variable. So because it's 2011, I just take the year of the election and I subtract their birth year. Now, I know I'm going to get some fuzziness from people who were like born after the election. I'm going to say that they're older than they actually were, but I, I don't particularly care that much. I'm looking for like ballpark close what their age was. And then I'm just going to tab age. Okay. And I'm going to set more off to do that. So I'll just run that. And poof, now I have this age variable that runs from negative 7,988. These are people who refuse to answer. So I know that these are the people I need to chuck out as missing. So I'm gonna do gen age, oopsies, recode age, recode age, that equals missing. And then I'm gonna go and make even thirds. Now, if you look at the assignment sheet here, for you, I'm telling you the thirds I want you to recode this into because I've looked at the 2015 election study and found out where those were and also written the quiz based on those categories. So you use those categories. Here though, I'm going to look at my even thirds. So I'm gonna do 18 through and I'm gonna look at my cumulative percent and here's third. So I've got 18 to 45 equals one, 46 through two, where's about two thirds. So what's interesting here is that 
I've got like 61 is right where I get my 66%, but that's a really awkward cutoff point. So I'm just gonna do 46 to 60 equals two for my middle category. And then I'm gonna do 61 through to the max, which is 98 equals three. Okay, I don't need a period there. Label define age one younger. Two is middle and three is older. Label values, age, age, tab, age. Okay. Uh, one of the things to note with just also the way you're talking about this in your research report, I wouldn't use things like elderly or things along those lines. You just want to kind of empirically describe what's going on. So you, your bottom category is your younger category. It includes a lot of people, like it's I would still fit into this category for quite some time. So like, this isn't exactly youth. Um, they just are younger. And also I think lots of folks who are only 61 wouldn't say that they are elderly anyway. So this is why I, my pitch is to use categories that are a bit more descriptive, like younger, middle and older. Okay, so I just need to run this and poof, there we go. And you can see at least with this distribution, they're pretty nice and even thirds. There we go, okay. Now I need to do my setup for voter turnout. So I am going to tab this guy. Tab new. Okay. So here I've got, did you vote in the election? Yes, no, don't know, refused. Um, if I wanted to tab this, just so I could see what the categories were, I would do a tab no label. And this is what I expect. So I've got a one and a five, and then an eight and a nine. I'm going to do something called binary coding, or I'm going to make a dichotomy here. So here's how I do that. I do, I'm going to generate voted, because I'm interested in people who have voted. Um, and so I'm gonna say that equals that particular variable, and I'm gonna recode voted, one equals one. These are people who said, yes, I voted. I'm gonna make the no's zero. So what this does, is it tells the computer that the thing I care about is the thing that has the one and the thing that is like, yeah, it's just binary coding. The thing I'm comparing it to is the thing that is the zero. And so it will frame everything in terms of zeros and ones. This particular way of coding, um, because it's a binary coding, it fudges the level of measurement a little bit. So remember in the, um, the lecture video for measures of association uh, for ordinal variables. So this is gonna be 3.3b. This is where I talk about um, how you can use coding to fudge levels of measurement. The way that you do that is to do this kind of binary coding with the zeros and the ones, right? And so if I wanted to tab voted at this point, before I put the value labels on, oopsies. Oops, I forgot to include that. It's like, what happened? There we are. Okay. So here you can see I've got the zeros and the ones. Yeah. Uh, this is just a good habit to get into. All right. So I'm going to add label define. One is voted. Zero is did not vote. Label values. Voted, voted, tab, voted. Okay. When we get into regression analysis, this kind of zero to one, um, hmm. Oh, I forgot. There we are. Yeah, when we get into regression analysis, this kind of binary coding is going to be really useful and important. So, like I say, best to get into the habit of doing it now. Okay, and the last thing I want to do is look at this duty variable, which is this one here. Okay. If I want to tab that with a no label, I can do that. I do it as it gets the one, five and eight nines. Okay. So I'm going to generate duty equals that variable. I'm going to recode duty. One stays the one, five is the zero, eight and nine is missing label define duty one is duty zero is choice label values duty duty tab duty okay all 
and there we are. Cool. There we are. There's my setup for testing this particular bit of a hypothesis. Uh, you'll notice I'm mixing things from the campaign period survey and the post-election survey. This is totally fine. Everybody who's in the post-election survey is also in the campaign period survey. So uh, it doesn't all like, so anybody who answered the first survey answered all the subsequent surveys, which means that that's why you can combine them all together. So here I am going to test the hypothesis in a crosstab. All right, let's look at the format again. Remember that it's going to be tab DVIV plus like all of my choices. So here I'm going to do tab. My dependent variable is voted. My independent variable is age. I know I want chi-square. Oh, I know I want column percentages because that's where my independent variable is. I know I want chi-square as my measure of statistical significance. And I'm going to show you all of the possible measures of association so you can see why Kramer's V is the best one for this. I'm, the syntax for Kramer's V is just V. For tau is just tau, and then gamma is that. So if you watched um, the 3.3b lecture video, it'll explain what, like, what tau and gamma are. And if you watch that one closely, um, you'll be able to see that I don't have the right shape of table to use tau. And I will point out why this is a problem um, when I run this particular crosstab. So here's the crosstab that I need to be able to see what's going on. Okay. So let's just make this big like that. And here we are. Here you can see I've got this pretty nice crosstab looking at voter turnout and or how voter turnout is affected by age or how age structures voter turnout in the 2011 Canadian election study. So one of the things I'm going to point out is that, again, you are to use 2015. This is not the crosstab that you will be running, but you'll be running the same one for the election that happened after this election. Right away, I can see that I need to look at one of the two rows here. I've named voting in my hypothesis, so this is the row that I'm going to interpret here. I can see that I've got a threshold effect. So I increase about 10 percentage points going from younger people who voted to middle age or to the middle of age of folks who voted. And then there's a very short, um, small gap here between uh, the people in the middle and the folks who are in the older category. So a 10 point gap followed by a two point gap. That's a threshold effect that suggests to me that the relationship is probably present and not too much. It's not too small, but it's also not as strong as it would be if I had like another 10 point gap, right? So I've got a 10 point gap and a two point gap. Here is where you're getting chi-square. You've got the chi-square actual value, but you have your probability here. Lots of you will get probabilities that are like this, where it's 0, 0.000. What this means is that the probability is less than one in 10,000 of you making a type one error. So like there is a one there. They stated just only reports three decimal points. And so it's not like your probability is absolutely nothing. It's that your probability is about one in 10,000, or it's certainly less than one in 1,000. So if I was reporting that, I would report it as... Um, P is less than 0 0.01. That's how I would write that out there. Um, which means that I'm, I'm well, like, I'm well under the threshold that we need, which is good. So remember that threshold is P equals 0 0.05. We need to be 95% confident we're not making a type 1 error. Here I'm really quite confident I'm not making a type 1 error. This means I can generalize uh, from this particular sample to the population. So I can say in 2011, um, the older somebody was, the really they were more likely they were to report voting in the 2011 election. Okay, what I want to draw your attention to is Kramer's V versus Gamma versus Tau B. So Kramer's V, if you remember, Kramer's V is a measure of association. So it's a bivariate descriptive statistic that can tell you uh, how strong a relationship is between an independent variable and a dependent variable. And here, Kramer's V of the three, I think, is the most reliable. I'll explain why in a minute. Here it's telling me that I have a moderate relationship, moderately weak, like it's not bad. For Canadian data, this is actually pretty good. Um, this is the idea that um, 
it's not proportional reduction in error, but in uh, video 3.3b, you'll see a table that's included in there that tells you like the thresholds for interpreting, um, like if a relationship is too trivial to be worth investigating, that's being below 0 0.1. And so you want to make sure that you're above that. Uh, but then, you know, between 0.1 and 0.14 is weak. Between 0.15 and 0.2 is moderately weak. Anywhere between above 0.2 is a moderate relationship. And if you're hitting 0.3, you're strong. So I would I would probably say that this is a moderately weak relationship. It's not pretty good. For Canada, this is pretty good. Um, tau B is underestimating this. So tau B is a little bit lower um, than uh, Kramer's V here. And it's because tau B... Uh, the tau that we can run in Stata requires a square table. So that would either be an independent variable with two categories and a dependent variable with two categories or a three by three, right? Here I've got a three by two table. So I've got three categories in my independent variable and two categories in my dependent variable. And so this is not the correct calculation. And as a result, it's underestimating the strength of the relationship because we're messing with one of the foundational parts of the stats. If you're asking yourself, why can't I run the correct one? And the answer is because you'd have to install a nasty package to Stata to make it work. I don't know why it doesn't come preloaded, um, but I'm not going to make you do that. Uh, just use Kramer V instead. What I want you to really see here is look at gamma. Look at the lying liar that gamma is. Like it's saying that not only is our relationship strong, but it's like really strong. It's like a knowing age improves our proportional reduction of error by like 42 percentage points. It's it's such a liar. It's such a liar. Um, yeah, video 3.3b explains why you shouldn't use gamma. You should use Kramer's V. Like gamma is massively overstating the strength of this relationship. So we will ignore that and use Kramer's V instead. So this tells me that the um, relationship between, or this hypothesis, I have preliminary confirmation of it. Um, the older someone is, the more likely they are to vote. Um, this seems to be true uh, where I... <laughs> like have very few people who reported not voting. Um, and then I have lots of uh, uh, people who didn't report that they voted. Now, the one thing I want to check on is my expected cell frequencies um, for chi-square, just to make sure that they're doing okay. And the reason why is that this is a really skewed variable. You can see that the distribution here uh, like 90 people percent, 90 percent of people said they voted compared to 10 percent of people who said that they didn't. And so I'm worried that a chi square might not be meeting its assumptions. So what I need to do is I need to like calculate, say, the expected cell frequency for I'm going to do this cell here because this is the smallest marginal and that's the smallest marginal. So if I'm OK, like I've, if I've got more than five people as my expected count there, then I'm OK for chi square, because remember, it's no more than 25 percent of cells have this expected count of fewer than five. So does anybody remember how you do this? You multiply the column marginal by the row marginal and divide by the total number of cases. Uh, I wonder if Stata will do this for me, if, I'll, if they'll do like 992 times 328 bracket. divided by 3307. Can I do that? Oh. Hmm. Can I do equals? No. Nope. Anyway, that's the math you have to do. 992 times 328. You can tell I don't do basic arithmetic in Stata. Uh, divided by 3307 gives me 98, right? So I, even though this is a super skewed dependent variable, I am not yet running into chi-square trouble at all. So I'm confident I'm not violating a chi-square assumption. And there we go. I've got that first original relationship. So things we need to remember, the gaps across the columns here are 10 points and 2 points. It's statistically significant, and it's moderately weak. This is the original relationship that we compare everything to. OK. How do we test for the effects of control variables, then? Testing for the effects. A control variable. Uh, video 3.4, both part A and part B, walk through examples on how to do this. Uh, and the kicker is that you need to make partial tables. 
So what you're always doing is you're always comparing the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable, but you're going to be doing it for every category of your control variable. So this idea of voting as a duty versus a choice is going to be um, my potential intervening variable for this uh, example. I can't have a source of spuriousness because there's no independent, like, common cause that could make somebody older versus younger. Like, it just doesn't work. And so age is one of these variables that when it's an independent variable, it can't have a source of spuriousness because nothing but time can cause it. And you can't make it, you can't make people younger either. Like, you can't induce that kind of variation. And so that's why age can't have a source of spuriousness. Uh, so the logic here is this idea that the reason why older people are more likely to vote than younger people is that older people uh, see voting as a duty. And so it's this kind of social duty that makes them and motivates them to go and vote. Uh, the logic would be people who see voting as a choice are going to be less likely to vote and younger people are more likely to see voting as a choice. And this is one of the reasons why um, we have this age gap in turnout. Now, I would note just uh, like how many people are voting here that lots of young folks are probably going to see voting as a duty. It's just that I think the older somebody is, the more likely they are to see voting as a duty versus a choice. So how do I test this? I'm just going to copy and paste my um, syntax here for that first table, and I'm going to modify it a little bit. So here I'm going to do if duty equals one. And then I'm going to just take that all again and make it if duty equals zero. You'll notice I've got the double equals there. So this is going to be, it's literally telling the computer to make a cross tab of the effect of age on voter turnout for everybody who said that voting was a duty, plus all my stats. And then the next one is make a cross tab um, for people who to see the effects of age on voter turnout for everybody who said that voting was a choice, right? You can see my duty and choice. So I'm just telling the computer to set those things up and run all of these particular stats. Okay, so remember that's my original relationship. Here, I'm just going to run this first one. Okay, so what happened here? Right away, I can see that the gaps across the columns narrowed. So this first one, so look at the younger folks, the like 90% of young po folks who like, these are only people who see voting as a duty. 90% of them in the youngest group are voting or 91% uh, compared to 95% in the middle compared to 97% in the older category. So instead of doing 10 percentage points and two percentage points as my gaps, I've got um, four percentage points and to almost two percentage points. So I've seen those gaps narrow. This suggests that the relationship has weakened. And this is what the statistics also confirm. It's still statistically significant, um, though I am going to check my expected cell frequency for chi-square. Again, these are my little ones here. So it's 669 times 130 divided by 2,422 total number of cases. So I have only 35 people as my expected cell frequency there. Um, and that expected cell frequency is what chi-square is imagining exists if no relationship was there. And so I'm still not violating the assumptions of chi-square, which is good. Uh, but I've like I've gone from a moderately weak relationship to like a weak, almost trivial relationship like chi-square is just, yeah, it, Kramer's V is telling me that relationship is seriously weakened. And so for people who see voting as a duty, age has much less of an effect on um, their likelihood to turn out to vote. So a lot of the power related to age has been taken away. This is what we would expect to see if it was, uh, if I was getting at a cause, but I can't draw a conclusion about that until I run all the partial tables. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run um, this same cross tab between age and if somebody voted or not. Uh, for people who see voting as a choice. Now, if this is an intervening variable, which is um, what I expect it to be, uh, this idea that the reason why age has this effect on turnout is because you've got this age is structuring whether or not people see voting as a duty versus a choice, then I should also see the relationship weaken in that second partial table. So let's run it and see if that's what we actually have. And the answer is no. Look at this. So remember that original 
first gap across that first set of columns was 10 percentage points. Here it's almost 20. So it's 18 ballpark. Um, so I've already seen, I've seen that widen. And what's really interesting is I've got this threshold effect still. So what's really becoming clear is that it's moving from that younger to that middle category that actually has the power to affect, like that's where age has its power on voter turnout. Not like, at least in 2011, not once you get to be, you know, you know approaching 60. It's really moving uh, here between um, your late 40s through your 50s, effectively, which is interesting, right? Anyway, uh, the whole point here is that the gaps across the columns have gotten bigger, especially with respect to younger and middle. And so I have a pretty clear threshold effect there. Um, but that first gap is big. So I would look at the table there and think, oh, this relationship's gotten stronger. And that's indeed what I find. So it's still statistically significant. My Kramer's V is uh, indicating that my relationship actually has gone from moderately weak to moderate. I've actually, it's confirming that the relationship got a lot stronger. Um, and so if I had hypothesized that this was an intervening variable, in order for me to confirm that it's an intervening variable, I would need to see a weakening in this first table, which I did. This is just for people who saw voting as a duty, but I would also need to see it in this one, which I didn't. So this means that seeing voting as a duty or a choice absolutely isn't an, it is not an intervening variable. It is not because I would need to see that weakening across both categories. So the conclusion that I can draw is as follows. Conclusions. The first is that age does affect voter turnout consistent with the hypothesis. Oopsies. Um, older people are more likely than younger people to vote. Uh, and then the second conclusion I would draw is um, seeing voting as a duty versus a choice is not an intervening variable. It is conditional. So uh, I see a weakening in one category of that control variable and a strengthening in the other that's doing different things. That means that it is a conditional variable on testing, uh, and that's that. If you're wondering for your research report, um, like how to deal with this, if one of your hypothesized sources of spuriousness or a hypothesized intervening variable is actually conditional on testing, all you need to do is actually correctly identify that this has happened. That's it. Uh, I don't want you to try to come up with a reason for why it might actually be conditional in terms of logic or theory. You've already done that work when you've like set it out in like deductively in part one of your research report, right? Um, so you already have good reasons for why you think that something's a source of spuriousness or an intervening variable. Um, and the thing with spuriousness and intervening variables is that you need to see that weakening across all those categories, otherwise, uh, all the partial tables, otherwise it's not spuriousness or it's not intervening, it's actually conditional. Uh, I, what I don't want you to do is to come up with some post hoc rationalization for why it actually is conditional. This is not, it never goes well, just don't do that. Where you're going to get your points is if you are doing this kind of work where you're running the original relationship describing what's going on in that table and then running each partial table and waiting until you get to the end of the analysis of all those partial tables to decide what the evidence is telling you. Is the evidence telling you you have a source of spuriousness? Is the evidence telling you have an intervening variable? Or is the evidence telling you that this thing that you thought was something else is actually conditional? Uh, and in this case, I would just correctly identify that it's seeing voting as a duty versus a choice is not, in fact, an intervening variable. Um, instead, what I've got is the relationship between age and voter turnout weakening for people who see voting as a duty, but the relationship between age and voter turnout strengthens for people who see voting as a choice. That makes it conditional. I don't know why. Uh, I just have to identify that it's correctly conditional, and then off I go.
So for tutorial exercise two, literally all you're going to be doing is, or for tutorial exercise number six, rather. So for the tutorial exercise, all you're going to be doing is replicating exactly what I just did here for the 2015 election study. So this is what this all looks like in 2011, what I've just shown you, but you get to do it for 2015 uh, for tutorial exercise and see what conclusions that you would draw as a result of that. Um, yeah, for your research reports, this is effectively what you're going to do three times over. So you're going to test for this original relationship and then for each of your three control variables, you're going to do this. You're gonna make those partial tables, you're gonna compare them to the original, and then you're gonna draw whatever conclusion the evidence from those partial tables tells you about what type of uh, control variable you actually have on testing and that's where you stop. Okay, good luck. Uh, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to be in touch with either me or the TAs. We're here to help you out with this stuff.